Okay, welcome to the show. I wonder if you heard that. Did you just hear that? I did, yeah. Meeting That's is being really recorded. It's the first time I've ever heard that on a recording in like eight years. So anyway, yeah, it's being recorded. Who knew? Um, <coughs> how do I normally start this? Okay, welcome to the show. My name is Paul Burgess and I'm here today with, um, I'm going to call him a good mate of mine, but even though I haven't seen him for about three years probably, um, Pete Williams from Functional Medicine Associates, which he, as I understand it, set up and created and is the mastermind behind, behind the whole project, right? Uh, true, yeah, yeah, we are, are sort of a rather well established uh, Central London practice now, um, yeah. whether we're going to keep it um, that way with COVID and those pretty huge um, Central okay. London and um, rents we're not too sure but um that's a conversation we're going to be having together over the next six months i think interesting but, yeah. yeah a lot of it's gone online absolutely yeah. yeah loving that stuff and and we are going to talk today about oral health and how much of a massive missing piece to a, a huge amount of puzzles it is and no one's really talking about it um of significance no one's really bringing you know people aren't really even hearing about this kind of stuff and we spoke before our lovely lady told us we'd start recording that um uh, we spoke about this about four years three or four years ago we did yeah. when you first started having an inkling into it and saying you know what i think there's some 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 traction here and there's some some benefit to this kind of thing and then fast forward we're in a position now where you've really run with this and created something quite uh useful and, and, and spectacular out of it so mr williams take it away tell us all about it so shall i start where i'll, I'll, I'll tell you where, where we'll start and um i'll tell you exposing my age um i this all started for me about 45 years of age so nearly seven years now um where i started having a problem with a back tooth and, and listen, I was a regular dentist go before this, regular hygienist go before that. Uh, and so anyway, this back tooth was bothering me. And, and so I went to the dentist and she said, uh, it's gonna have to come out, Mr. Williams. I said, well, okay, fair enough. You know, I've got a good set of teeth. I'm not gonna lose one, it's no drama. And I said, so, you know, what's wrong with it? And she says, well, you know, you have got pretty well established periodontal disease. And so I think hit me in two fronts. Number one was, oh my God, I've got a disease. Um, and then number two was, I didn't even know what periodontal disease was. So that was, uh, I think that was more the embarrassment and the shock of, I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, really. And here's a, probably a disease in medicine that actually I was embarrassed to say that I had very little idea on. Um, and so, of course, huffed and puffed, left the consultation. And um, that was um seven years ago and as you say Paul we talked probably about two or three years ago when I was several years into it and the science on on on, on um oral health um and I think more importantly how it affects systemic health and how it relates to disease is overwhelming I just want to give you some I just want to give you some recent um figures from uh, a 2021 paper it was in Nature Review it's really just looking at um, oral health and how it influences systemic health you're three times the risk of obesity with poor poor dental health gum disease is three times so you're three times more likely to be obese because you've got problems with your gums um, and and periodont you know periodontal disease there is some talk that your risk of alzheimer's it increases by 70 percent mm -hmm. from having poor oral health um, we're, we're certainly looking at at least 25 percent increased risk of cardiovascular disease yeah. Um, and, 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 and the list goes on. We know things like type 2 diabetes and controlling type 2 type diabetes. If you haven't asked your patients or um, had a conversation with regards to oral health, then we know that type 2 diabetes and periodontal disease are bidirectional relationships. One is driving one and one is driving the other. So again, once I started digging into this, I started to actually think about patients that have obviously come through the practice over the years where you know I've done a good job but maybe you know not the results that I would hopefully wanted to achieve and that's because I never asked the question and I never asked that question about you know what's your dental health um, and that's opened as you say a whole new 
rich data source of, of really understanding how oral health impacts and drives and can be not only uh, associated, but it, in many ways causal um, in many of these chronic diseases. So for us now at Functional Medicine Associates, it's absolute standard of practice that we not only ask what is going on but from a point of view of your, your, you know, your historical history with dental health, but we actually take the second and third steps and that we do all the investigations. So, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of oral diagnostics. We want to look at, um, and we've done two things, as you know, Paul, um, we are um, heavy users of um, understanding the oral microbiome. And we do a lot of testing around that. Um, but in, in particular, testing for oral pathogens, um, because again, of their association, and that, I'll go on to explain that. But I think more importantly, um, I've been on a sort of two year mission to have a, uh, an oral genomics panel um, built. Um, and that's just about to come to fruition. We're, we're, we're going to be rolling that out from the end of June, we think, pretty much. Yeah. And so uh, over these years, we, we, um, what we've been able to do is actually, uh, and something I've wanted to do, and I say this because we're just seeing some profound changes, more than I would ever expect. Um, we've had, we've had so one of our case studies has just been um, given the go-ahead to be presented at the big IFM conference in June. So um, myself and uh, a, bi um, a functional, and again, interestingly, which I'll get into, myself and a functional dentist. So mm -hmm. I've worked on a, a patient and we've completely put her seemingly unrelated disease, which is rheumatoid arthritis, pretty much into remission from really aggressive rheumatoid as well, because we, we answered the question when we asked the question about her, um, her oral health. And of course, she was under a, uh, another really good um, FM doc for about six months, very comprehensively looked at uh, and treated, but didn't, didn't really change her symptoms at all. And, you know, I just look at that one and think, well, that's because he didn't, he didn't ask the question. And I did when she came to see me. We asked the question. We literally changed her around in 12 weeks. So <clears> we've <throat> taken her from really active rheumatoid arthritis from a disease process to pretty much in remission in 12 weeks because... We asked the question and um, we got a, a dentist who understands the joined up thinking as we're all moving to. And we, we worked on, you know, that was the keystone for me. The keystone was, her, if you like, her oral health was the, was the key to what was setting off all these symptoms. And again, when you look into the literature with regards to rheumatoid arthritis and periodontal disease, again, very, very similar disease driven by very similar genetics and very similar underlying mechanisms. So our, our, our case study paper for the IFM conference was entitled Periodontal Disease and Ruminant Arthritis, Killing Two Birds with One Stone. Mm. And I think that's, and, and yeah, you know what, it's a case study, it's an N of one, but within 12 weeks, we've done some pretty significant work with this lady. And again, so much so, as you say, that you know, the IFM have said, yeah, this looks good, let's you can, you, you know, we, we're going to accept you as a, as a case study for a poster study. So we know we're doing good stuff. I mean, this is what's been happening for us in clinical practice now for, for several years. And of course, the whole point about that, and we've called the, we've called the oral genomics panel DNA Smile. Um, and what we've done is that we've built a, uh, an online course um, to be certified, um, which I can, I can go in and explain what we've done on that, if you would like. Yeah, so we'll, we'll chat about that in a moment for sure. Okay, so you know, I, I, I think, as you say, what we've what we've identified, and I, again, probably look at the draw and embarrassment from the fact that I was so embarrassed when I left the dentist's um, and chair that time that periodontal disease. I just wasn't really sure what that was. You know, that um, that's brought us into this position where I think we're doing some field leading work with regards to understanding where that fits and, and again it's just that same thing it's like yeah but we haven't asked you know these cases come in all the time we're just like that what's your dental health and you realize it's pretty poor and then you realize you know there I suppose some of the other aspects of how it's certainly at our practice we we're looking at patients now um, and so obviously we get lots of patients who come into us who've been to see other people before being heavily tested conventionally and sometimes they've again just been looked at in a we look at them in a slightly different way and we're looking at them 
uh, through some of the new mechanisms that we're learning about disease. Number one, you know, if humans are more bacteria than human cells, which has been proved, we're slightly more bacterial cells than human, then it would be logic to ask the question, what's the health of your bacteria? Because of course, humans are holobians, so we are, a, a, we are sort of, uh, we're a super organism. We are a combination of um, fundamentally bacteria cells and human cells living in this human body as a sort of vehicle. And of course, we, number one, we want to get on um, because we want a nice place to live. And so one key aspect to the health of you is making sure that the health of your bacteria, wherever it is, I mean, we've identified that there's bacteria pretty much on every single surface of your body, dominated through the, um, the oral tract. And so, you know, in functional medicine associates, we ask those questions sometimes. It's like, yeah, but no one's asked about the health of your bacteria. And maybe that's where we start. We're also very keen, and I'm very keen on, on um, some of the other mechanisms that we're learning with regards to why oral health um, and, and gut health is so important. And that's the mechanism of bacterial translocation. And so what we're talking about there is that what happens when bacteria that should be in certain places have the opportunity to get inside the body. And, and this is the key aspect with regards to, um, as, I suppose, a leaky gut or, you know, leaky gums and, you know, um, a leaky brain is that we have these borders that protect us from the outside world. You know, the, the brain is a blood brain barrier. Uh, you know, our, our mouth has our gums and they should be protecting us. And our GI tract has a GI tract. But when those borders get more permeated for whatever reason, you have a risk factor then that you have armies of certain things and, and probably dominantly endotoxins and bacteria that can translocate mm. from one localized area to another. And then suddenly, and let's give you an example of that. Let's give you an example of, again, if we're talking about cardiovascular disease, how certain bacteria, certainly oral pathogens, maybe like porphyrus gingivalis, can slip through. Um, uh, and when we're talking about gum disease, mate, we might be talking about um, gum recession. We might be talking about irritated and inflamed gums. We might be talking about bleeding gums when you, know, you clean your teeth, you spit it out, it's a bit of blood there. These are active indicators that all is not well there. And when that, when that gets more pronounced and you start getting these periodontal pockets, and again, what we mean by there is when your gums start to come away from your teeth, you're starting creating these little hideouts for these bacteria to start populating to build lovely biofilms that are very difficult to get rid of and also give them an entrance inside the body. And when they translocate, you know, you can start to, and they can go anywhere. This is the point. And this is the scary thing for me in particular with regards to Alzheimer's um, because this translocation of certain oral bacteria are being found in Alzheimer's brains. Um, and that's pretty scary because what that's saying is bacteria that are pathogenic in your mouth have somehow got into your body and have ended up in your brain. And of course, what we're understanding from Alzheimer's, the, 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 the proteins that in the end um, that we're looking at, um, uh, the amyloid plaques and the tau that really are involved with the, the, the destruction of the brain are actually the ones that are trying to prevent the problem. They are almost like your, your brain soldiers protecting against invaders. But this is what it comes back to about borders. If your border is always compromised, whether that's orally, gastrointestinal, or a blood-brain barrier, your brain, those, those, those proteins are always going to have to try and defend you against it. And so we're learning, particularly in Alzheimer's, that it's less about, you know, is this about um, APOE4 um, genotypes? It's certainly still a player. Or is it also about how we defend from the outside world? How does that blood-brain barrier try to defend you? And if it's always compromised, then it's always, there's always going to be a fight. Yeah. And so, you know, th they are the main mechanisms, this bacterial translocation I'm very interested in because of course we just see it all the time. You know, we're just seeing that when you see a back, when you see something that gets inside, your immune system has to respond. That's its job. But it responds, of course, in increased inflammation, increased autoimmune activation and oxidative stress. Everything that you don't want, yeah. well, you certainly, you want for a very, very, very short period of time, and then that needs to calm down. But if it's, that is always happening, Paul, you can have these people who are just sort of 
chronically inflamed and accelerating every single disease process that you can that you can um, you yeah. can think about. So th there's so much there to to cover. Firstly, I do remember many years ago it being quite well established that gum disease has a, a direct effect on cardiovascular risk. And Absolutely. I remember speaking to a patient a few years back and just by looking at him, I'm, you know, I'm kind of like, when was the last time you went to the dentist? And I remember his reply, it was, oh, don't you know, it's a, it's a big con, that is, I've not been for 20 years. I went, okay, well, just here, here's some information. Cardiovascular disease, gum, gum health, kind of intrinsically linked. And he even made a comment that his gums bled when he ate a banana. That's how bad they were. And it's consequently, to be fair, he went on and had an awful lot of work done, got on massively uh, repaired and fixed, spent an awful lot of money and was in a good place with it. Um, but also, I, uh, and I know I don't have the paper to hand um, and I should have dug it out before we started, but I'm sure I read something recently that said, even just by brushing your teeth in the evening, people who miss that evening toothbrush, uh, you know, brushing their teeth, had worse insulin sensitivity the next day. So by making sure you brush your teeth in the evenings as well as the mornings, it, it actually had an effect of improving your insulin sensitivity, which I thought was quite interesting because Alzheimer's is very much driven by insulin. Absolutely, and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the whole thing is, is together. And then yeah. finally, the point you made about the body being under such an... In, assault of of issues with inflammation and oxidative stress and so on the, the the oral microbiome and where that you know gum disease and everything else is affecting us is in excess of or on top of the mold and the maybe heavy metals yeah. and yeah. environmental toxicity and everything else that you've been harboring in your tissue for so long yeah. and none of it's being looked at in real depth but it's not uncommon to get a mold, you know, uh, environmental toxicity, heavy metals test done and potentially do some work on it. But there's nowhere that does the oral stuff quite the way you're talking about. And, if yeah, it, and you know, I'm not being funny, right? If it is like uh, as effective as you say, and I'm, if is, when I say if, it's almost as though I'm questioning you and I'm not, because I believe in your work 100%. And I know how conscientious you are about what you do. Um, but being as it is as, as effective as it is, when this call finishes, I will do that course whenever it starts, and I will add that straight into my pre-testing for any patient that comes in, because yeah, it I mean, is so, a, a massively important area we're not looking at. Yeah, I, so I think sometimes the I, I look at sort of my journey through functional medicine, and I was a very early adapter of it, and that's I suppose had probably more pros now, but there's been a lot of cons with that, and there's been a lot of and, and still actually. You know, if, if we look we are where we are with how I think now, you, you just, you know, 25 years in, your thought process and thinking process with patients is completely different as far as how you would look at a patient. So you're going to look at a patient differently. And um, whilst that's been, you know, in, incredibly helpful and insightful because you're just going to look at a patient uh, in a very different way, you're also waiting for people to catch up. So what we're doing, I mean, you know, it, it's a chuckle, isn't it? Because, you know, I think COVID, COVID maybe has brought us into the fact that actually we should be taking a little bit more vitamin D or getting out some more sun, you know. And, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were talking about that 25 years ago. And so I, I just think, you know, if you look at the literature on, on, on um, um, oral and systemic health, it's been there for 25 years. Yeah. So it's not that we're reinventing the wheel. I think what I've been able to do is because I think slightly differently and I've had the experience and then I've, and, and also to be fair, you know, I've had some patients where I haven't done as good a job as I could, as I should have, because I just didn't know. Yeah. And now I know I'm just like, Oh Christ, I wish I'd had so-and-so again, because that would be first port of call. And what I would say on that, certainly on, on, um, it being standard of practice, it almost feels like, Paul, it's malpractice if you're not asking now. Because, you know, again, I, I, let me give you some examples. Uh, you know, an obesity patient, three times more likely. You know, I, I can't not ask that question. Um, and I can't not identify that. And as you know, obesity, yes, we, we can look at it, but it's fundamentally driven by inflammation. And if you've got periodontal disease, 
it's fundamentally driven by inflammation. And so I'm looking at this going, well, what is the, what is one of the major root causes of why that might be going on? And when we need to get that down, because if you can't control the periodontal disease, you won't be able to control any of the other systemic diseases that are developing because they're all being underpinned by similar genes, but very much similar underlying mechanisms, which are going to be immune activation, which are going to be um, inflammation, oxidative stress, which are running all those chronic diseases. Yeah. And so what I've, I've looked to do over the years, based on the experiences we've had, based on how we understand the science and also how we're implementing it, is that sometimes you get a patient, I mean, that rheumatoid one that we're gonna be having presented at the IFM conference, it was just almost like a, just, a, just a beautiful example of, and if anyone takes anything away from, from, from today, is that you've just gotta start asking the question. Because if you do that, it's gonna lead you down a completely different way of how you're gonna strategize how you're looking at patients. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you, you don't have the, the fully integrated um, picture, but for a lot of these patients, it is, wow, this is just like there is a massive war going on there and we've not even thought about it. And until that war is understood and calmed yeah. and, and controlled, we're always going to have problems elsewhere. And this is what the fundamentals of what the DNA smile training is going to do. What I wanted to identify is the pre and, and this is where the genetics um, uh, um, um, consultants have been brilliant. Is that what I'm saying? I need we need to identify which are the most predisposing genes to increase periodontal disease, both from a, both from an, um, an innate immune aspect and an uh, and an acquired and inflammatory aspect. Um, and so, because what we're learning, I think, with periodontal disease is uh, like. And COVID is a good example of this, and so is, is obesity and type two diabetes. And then you can start to see already how these are linking, is that they are underpinned by pro-inflammatory genetics. And what I mean by that is that what we've looked at is the genes around ones that are gonna cause your immune system to overreact. So we're looking at people who, who, whose um, immune systems are actually, Paul, a bit too bloody good at their job. Yeah. And so they love a scrap. They can't wait to have a scrap. They overreact having a scrap and then they don't like turning off. And so this is what we're, this is fundamentally what we've been finding on case studies that the ones with the most advanced. It's, it's a bit like you out on a Saturday night, right? Well, I like to say, I use the analogy because again, what we've got to be able to do, haven't we? We've got to consistently be able to translate this into the patient story. Yeah. And so I'll say to him, I said, look, that lady well, again again so yeah we had a thunderstorm and we lost peter bless him because he got very scared and hid under a table and he doesn't like lightning and thunder <laughs> like you do but he's back now he feels better and um and the whole lot basically stopped so apologies to people listening but um we're back and we're going to talk about the course that uh, yeah so and i just remembered what we were talking about actually before we went well then um, it was it was all about um what do I think that we've been able to do with the course? And I think what does 25 years of being in functional medicine give you? Well, it gives you a, a different way of thinking about things, but it also gives you this, I think, we'll, we, I think we can all recognize in medicine that um, a lot of maybe what is um, people find, you know, like vitamin D is a classic example of, oh, I'm not so sure you'd be, you should be giving that to people. But the reality is, is that the evidence has been there for 30, 40 years. And so, and so with, with what we've done with DNA Smile, again, is, is that you, you can't ignore what the evidence is telling you. 
I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. It's like, holy cow, how can we, you can't ignore it. And one of the key things about this, Paul, is that where we think DNA smile and, and um, where I think this is gonna explode is actually in dentistry. So we've been, I've been working for, um, from, well, let me take a step back. I got asked to speak uh, at a dental conference about three years ago. And so I did a, I did a, a conference speech on um, how we looked after a patient, of course, with oral diagnostics um, in there. We, we hadn't done a DNA smile by there. And it was literally one of those where I'm, I'm speaking to a group of dentists and the, the jaws were on the floor because suddenly it's like, right okay so this guy's fixing it all together you can understand how oral health is affect you know is affecting pretty much every pro-inflammatory disease that we can think about and that's snowballed that snowballed where now um i'm regularly speaking and one guy in particular to um some of the i suppose the the most well-known um, um mercury-free and biological dentists not just in europe but worldwide because one of the other aspects that I wanted to do with DNA Smile, and we've got two DNA Smiles, we've got DNA Smile and then we've got the add-ons. And what I wanted to put in the add-ons was um, um, APOE4, the lipid genomics on that one, detoxification, because I want to be able to give people who, you know, are sort of having that conversation about, should I take my mercury fillings out? That what we're doing there is saying, well, I think in my perspective, should people have mercury in their mouths? No. Um, and I think even the FDA now in the US has basically said that susceptible genotypes probably shouldn't have mercury in their fillings. Um, and so, you know, if you're an APO E3 or E4 or 44, you definitely shouldn't, in my opinion, should be having mercury in your mouth because the potential risks for that as we go forward. Paul, sorry, let me just turn my mail off so that it's not going to make that noise. Apologies. And so not only what we're doing on this is that we're not only I'm not only looking at this from the point of view of if I'm a fun functional medicine practitioner, how should I be looking at this patient? I'm also trying to bring this into dentistry with these guys to say, you know, and try and bring practitioners to give their patients the, the sort of um, more scientifically grounded opportunity to say, yes, it, mercury in your mouth is probably going to be more problematic than in someone else. And so we want to be able to get to that position. Um, to say, yeah, this is something that uh, that you probably should and would need to do. So, you know, I've got a patient at the moment, APOE4, E4 genotype, so significant risk for Alzheimer's, significant periodontal disease, you know, and significant fillings. You know, is that something we might need to think about when if she's asking the question? I think the answer to that is um, yes. I think we probably, you know, is it, am I at increased risk? Definitely. And so we're, we're doing a lot of work with the dentist as well, which is fantastic. You know, some of the strategies that they're using, localized, localized sort of um, antibiotics in the pockets, brilliant stuff. And so it's opening this new world. And one of the key things that I would say to this, that anyone who wants to do the training, I will keep, I will firmly say you're going to open a completely new revenue, revenue and referral scheme because dentists are all over this. Yeah. They're desperate. What they can't do, Paul, is there are, there are parts that they, they cannot do legally that you will be doing. Yeah. And so you start forming this, this relationship with, with dentists because, you know, I'm sending people to dentists, they're doing their job and they say, well, you have a look at so-and-so and, and you've literally got a new revenue stream. The, so the, I think that's the, the other fantastic thing. I think the challenge a lot of people have got to realise is that you can't go to what I'm going to say is a regular dentist. They do need to be a biological dentist that understands how to remove mercury without making the problem worse because yeah. a lot of people if they're just going to drill it out you're going to have a lot more challenges to face. Uh, and and so this is where we're trying to what 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 i've been working on the last six months is trying to build this step-by-step -step algorithm from almost the patient experience so that in the end in the next few months we'll be able to give to the practitioner who's done the course here's your script yeah. does your patient have amalgams you know have they had their APOE4 genotype done? Have they got the genomics? They will probably likely be the ones that you would add on to DNA, DNA smile, because then, because of course, this is a conversation many of us are having in this integrative world. Um, and as you say, now the FDA in the US have recently come out and said, probably susceptible genotypes shouldn't be having amalgam fillings. Um, and okay, so, so, so a couple of questions then. Firstly, periodontal disease, 
from my understanding, which is very basic in this area, the, the oral microbiome has a lot of a big part to play in keeping that under control and yeah. some of the and some of the knock-on things. So when when a baby is born through the birthing canal naturally, they tend to pick up a lot of bacteria from the mother through that birthing process and that starts their GI yeah. tract. So we're told, yeah. right? The, the, the yeah. microbiome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where does the oral microbiome initially get established? What does that so, is at the same time? It's the same time. And here's, here's how I try to tell the story is that your GI tract starts at your mouth and it finishes at your bum. Yeah. And so for me, there is, there is no difference. That is your GI tract. It's just that there are different components and parts of it. What I would say about the mouth, the oral microbiome is the second most diverse. But the thing about the oral microbiome, it is the first point where humans essentially sample and taste the outside world. And so it's a crucial battlefield. Yeah. And this is what, how I look at it. It is absolutely crucial that you're understanding the, you're understanding the army that protects you there, your immune system. This is what the oral genomics do. And who is on the battlefield? Yeah. So I, I tell the story about the Battle for Helm's Deep, that sort of, if you can remember that massive battle scene that's on the Lord of the Rings. And you've got the armies coming in. And you've got the big Helm's Deep, this beautiful big castle with all your protective guards around it. And, and that's literally what's happening second by second. So the key aspect to that is that if you've got periodontal disease, and that could be gum recession, bleeding gums, you know, you can take your pink, it's on a spectrum with regards to things to think about, is that that's what's happening. And you want to know, am I winning the battle? So for me, who's, you know, being incredibly healthy, it's a good diet still, what we've learned on my genomics is my, my, my genomics are too pro-inflammatory. So they're likely to set off. And that means people like me with pro-inflammatory genetics have to work much harder to be able to keep that battle on the appropriate side. So for me, with a, you know, with reasonably established periodontal disease, I'm not going to get rid of it because my genes will always dictate that I'm always prone to it. What I've got to be able to do is be able to mitigate and slow down and control it as much as possible and we've done a bloody good job over the last few years it's not easy it's like everything it's day-to-day -day, step by step but i think what we're being able to do on an individual basis is start answering those questions and then being able to start extrapolate that into into um, different aspects of different disease processes so i look at i look at what we've done with with dna smile is that it's one of the it's not the only answer, it never is, but it's a major root causative answer that you cannot afford not to ask or not to go and um, investigate whenever you have a, it's certainly rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, I mean, I, I mean, Alzheimer's, you take your pick. Yeah. So, okay, a couple of things then. We are told for, for you know, good oral health, that mouthwash, you know, gets, gets rid of so much more than just brushing alone and all that kind of stuff. My view on that kind of thing is that actually that can be too sterile because we do need that bacteria in there. So what, from your perspective, maybe the toothpaste that we use, you know, it has the fluoride yeah. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And, and again, I think we're looking at that. So there's a couple of things, and this has been the interesting thing about the transition and working with certain dentists. Um, <clears throat> There's, there's the fluoride debate, of course, and I think what is happening on that now is that there are new types of toothpastes coming out that are natural, um, that are, in the science, stacking up against fluoride. So I look at that and I think, okay, the only problem, Paul, is the, is the price, like everything. Uh, yeah. um, so there's been, there's, been, there's been some studies that looked at course, hydroxy the appetite. It's the same with organic. Sorry? It's the same with Yeah, of course, food. of course, yeah. The so, you know, we're looking at we're looking at products that you can use that stack up scientifically. Um, and of course, it's just a, a, a it's just a gentle journey to transition people over there. Again, we could say the same with mouthwashes um, from a point of view of there is definitely evidence. Certainly, if you know, if you've got a type two diabetic or a hypertensive where um, certain certain mouthwashes actually induce hypertension. Um, as, as a part of a mechanism because what they're doing is actually destroying some of the, the bacteria on the back of the tongue. So some of the species on the back of the tongue are actually involved in taking um, nitrates from foods and changing them so that your body can use your eyes and make nitric oxide, which of course is a, is a relaxant. 
Um, so we're seeing that and we're building all of this. So you're getting this picture of what would you do? And again, Paul, the fundamentals of this is that someone said to me, yeah, so all you're, all you're telling me is that you just need to sort of clean your teeth better. And the answer to that is, yeah, <laughs> there is, that, it, that is almost like the answer to everything. But how many things do we say about that in health that they just don't do it? You've got to sleep better. You've got to eat better. You've got to, you know, you've got to take the appropriate exercise. You've got to do stress reduction and people don't do it. And so what you've got to be able to do is really dig deep into the fundamentals so that you can individualize that process for them. And in one of the case studies that you'll see on the, that I've just filmed for the online training is that the biggest intervention, you'll have this all the time and many people listen to this all the, all the time, is that your patients are complex. And sometimes you just need a test result to go, it's time for change. Yeah. This can't go on. And then some, and so, and, and the, the, the second case presentation I've just done was a classically that he was a chap who was already had significant periodontal disease at 39. He was already under dentists and they weren't really, in my opinion, again, I don't understand. Maybe it's because they're just not reading the literature, Paul. They were doing nothing for it. Yeah. And I look back at that now and think this guy's 39 and he's already having two floss because he's got super advanced periodontal disease. And, and, and so because he was, he, and he was coming to me for completely different things. And I said to him, I said, look, you know, the biggest skill I had, the biggest win was be able to start taking down the narrative that actually maybe this is really problematic. And, you know, this is something that is linked and here's the testing that we should be doing. And we were able to transition him into that story to go, oh, okay. Um, yeah. And that's a problem. And, and so we had to build him on that. The, the, the challenge I think is that, Many people will brush their teeth twice a day, right? And many people will have a bit of mouthwash maybe sometimes. They do go to the dentist, they see the hygienist, but they still have the gum disease, the receding gums, yes. bleeding and so on. And yeah, so, you go, so okay, I'm doing all of that kind of daily housework that I need to do to keep it in place. But then there's no real talk about how do I reestablish a good microbiome in the gut? And also, you know, we're seeing kids now, very young, when their milk teeth are dropping out rotten, not because their big ones are coming through, and then the big ones are coming through already diseased Yeah. by, uh, you know, poor, um, just basically way too much sugar, yeah. lots of nutrient deficiencies because of the way they're being yeah. fed and whatnot, right? Yeah. And so it kind of stems right the way back to there. Absolutely. And we're looking at these young kids, babies and, and up, that are, that are on this path of oral destruction, if you like, and it's not yeah, the only thing yeah, that yeah. they're getting problems with, but it's certainly gonna exacerbate later. We, we yeah. can't just turn that around by saying, brush your teeth twice. You know, we've got no, to basically I, I, so that, that, that whole microbiome. Just on DNA Smile, we've included um, three variants um, that is related to sweet tooth. And so we have, we've done a couple of gene variants that are related to glucose sensing. And some people have genes that mean that the glucose sensualin and the insulin receptors are a little bit sluggish. So actually they need, they need more sugar before those receptors go, oh, okay, there's sugar in the system. And so we know they are susceptible to, to dental curries, losing the teeth. And we're also, we're also put another gene in there that senses bitterness. And again, you'll have some, you'll see this particularly in children where um, they are bitter tasters, i.e. meaning that you know, if you gave them vegetables, the, the bitter compounds in the vegetables are so strong for them. It's not that they don't want to eat the vegetables. Yeah. It's completely overpowering for them. So you'll have these individuals who are more likely to have sweet tooth. And I think if I look at that, not only them, we're identifying what I think there's going to be a massive um, um, role for this testing is when you're starting to deal with athletes. Athletes who may be susceptible to sweet tooth, pro-inflammatory, and of course, you know, again, as I said to you before line, I'm just watching a Giro at the moment and, you know, they are sucking sugar um, um, and sh uh, sugar um, s gels like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. So, you know, you are going to see, and it's always a spectrum, isn't it? And it's the spectrum is determined with regards to, you know, the genomics. You're going to have some people who, you know, can eat whatever they want and they probably teeth are pretty good. And you'll have some people who, you know, just really, regardless of how good they are, they're going to be susceptible and they're going to have to work really, really hard to save their teeth, mm. you know, and unfortunately I'm sort of, I'm more down, down that way. 
um, which is, you know, is disappointing. And if I hadn't learned this five years ago, I probably would certainly be having teeth removed now. Um, but again, I've managed to completely reverse the process. Yeah. Um, that's the wrong thing to say. You never re completely reverse the process. But, you know, these periodontal pockets, these pockets where the gums come away, start to degrade away from the teeth, you know, for me were very significant five years ago. Again, and the other thing, Paul, about this is that for the majority of the population, particularly as you go over 40, it's completely silent. It's asymptomatic, mm -hmm. as it was for me, completely asymptomatic until that first tooth started showing and then you know you realize oh my god and you actually start really looking you think god i have got gum recession and i have got gum recession and yeah you know my teeth my teeth do bleed sometimes when i'm flossing and then you realize god this has been going on for years and uh, is that related is what else well and again so the, so the point is is that if you had the periodontal disease there then your chances of having other systemic diseases are really very high and so it's a question of as, as i said is that sometimes one of the major root causes is completely unrelated mm. and but this is where joined up thinking in medicine matters so much because if you can deal with one of those major root causes you're, you're putting people in a, just such a, a better position can i can i talk about the course yeah absolutely so so look what, what we try to do is that we've recognized i think like everyone that um although it'd be great to be face to face it increases the price and everything and and so what we've what we've looked to do is is really design a panel called DNA Smile, and it's got two sides of it. We've got the add-ons, which again we talked about the mercury and the detoxification and the APOE the APOE four status as well. Um, what we tried, what I've tried to do is um, is collaborate with lots of other people to, to build this DNA Smile. So it's a genetic test, really giving you just I believe beautiful insights with regards to number one the state of state of your mouth but also how, and obviously the, your unique genomics that go there, but how that predisposes you for developing peri periodontal disease and other systemic diseases. And this fundamentally was born out because of that story of, you know, my story and then recognizing, reading the literature, recognizing the relevance of this, and then looking back at those patients where I thought, oh crap, I should have. I should have done that with that patient. If only I knew now what I knew that, you know, what I knew now that if I could have used it then, which hindsight's a beautiful thing. So what we've done is we created a, a, a genomics panel that really looks at 20 genes. They are variants involved with some of these key biological processes that are um, innate immunity, acquired immunity and inflammation, which is all about how does your defense force defend you from the outside world? Um, we're looking at sweet tooth predisposition. We're looking at detoxification lipids. Um, and we've built that pro a profile through, as you say, 20, um, 20 gene variants. And what we've also done on that is that we've looked at the literature and we've been able to design the reports and the recommendations that go with the individualized and um, genomic reports. So, you know, we've been able to put all that together. It's all, you know, um, with science. And what we've done as well is not only give you recommendations from a point of view of maybe you should be taking this person towards a mediterranean diet etc cetera, etc cetera. we're also saying next steps and that next steps may be this is what you need to do to tell a dentist but also you know and um, in this genotype you need to be you know monitoring crp or blood spot fatty acids so that we're saying here's what we found here's what the literature tells us here's how we control it and here's some of the things that you should do going forward and so we built that in, in into a report what we've also looked to do is, is again, um, I've been using, I've been working with um, DNA Life for probably nearly 15 years now. And I think there's a lot of genomics companies out there, um, some good, some not so good, depending on the training. These guys' are, training is, is, is very, very thorough. And, and as a part of that, we, you know, we've built this course. So, so the course is comprehensively um, um, built. It's online. It's on a really nice user-friendly platform. And we've, we've sort of divided it into six comprehensive modules. So, because what we're trying to do is that we recognize that um, genomics and using genomics can be morally or problematic. So you've got to know what you need, what you've got to know, you've got to understand your genes, you've got to understand why you're using them, you've got to understand what it really means and what you can sort of say and what you can't say. And so what we've done is sort of uh, we, we're, we're grounding it in some overview of lifestyle genomics, you know, the science and, and why we why we developed the test. And then we, 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 we've got the uh, we've got the geneticist taking you through 
some of the biological, all the biological areas, they're relevant scientifically, but importantly, the applicability to your patient and to the report. So we've gone all through that. What we're talking about is here's the gene, here's the gene variant, here's what the relationships are with systemic disease and periodontal disease, and here's what you can do with regards to, you know, what the report is telling you from what you need to do with your patients. And so we've designed all that. We've got all the intervention guidelines that we're doing um, from a point of view of diet and, and nutraceuticals, lifestyle, and importantly, the dental support, because with many of these patients, you're going to need to form relationships with the right dentists. Um, and for me, again, certainly on case study two, there wasn't a relationship for me. So I had to do it on my own um, because, as you say, he was already being treated. But they weren't interested and again still can't understand why but it is what it is i think we've all come up against that um and so you know sometimes you might have to go on your own but importantly you're looking for that connection um with a dentist that is thinking this way and they're all i mean for me many of these dentists now whether it's biological dentists mercury dentists or functional dentists they can't ignore the science and you know they're, they're... it's the same sort of challenge we have with doctors Right? When they go, no, no, I'm not accepting that. Lyme, no, forget it. It's not, yeah. for, it's not for us. It's not something we deal with. It doesn't exist. And, and you're going to get the dentists that are very conventional, but the ones that are more progressive are, are really going to want to know what this stuff's about. It's going well, to be think... appeal to them because it shows them that, you know, it, they're, they're already interested in what the, the yeah, downstream sure. effects are. And so they want to I see think... that thing. Yeah. The, the, and I think this is a question of, Sorry, Pete, quick, quick question. If someone's already had their genetics done, if they've got like, um, you know, their, 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 their full genome, can they use that? Can, there can would they just be, the... Yeah, there would probably be some, if, the, if, the all, if those appropriate have been analyzed, um, you may be able to look at that and make some assumptions from that. Um, for sure. But you couldn't send yeah. you the, it's not like you could send you the report and you could import it. And no, then... again, I, I think, well, not unless you're going to pay me for a couple of days to analyse all of it. As you know, I think, I think what I've always looked at what, we, what we've done is that I think a lot of gen genomics reporting are very much um, raw data. Yeah. Um, and what we're doing is saying, here's the gene, here's what it represents, here's what you're going to see. Um, and so you're very, very clear on each gene. You're learning what that gene means. You're learning the differences on the variants. So you're very, very clear what that means. And I think, as you say, I think we've done a very clear guidelines on that. And even people who are new to this, I still think we've written it in enough. And I've done the first case study to show them what it looks like in practice. But even if you follow the guidelines and the reporting, you're still going to do a fundamental good job. You know, yeah. you might not understand the second and third and fourth and fifth layers because I'll do moderate, I'll do easy case studies, moderate and very advanced. Um, and, you know, the very advanced are the ones that are people who may have been looking at this 10, 15 years and got a really full, deep understanding about how it all fits. But for many people, they're completely overwhelmed. So what we try to do is say, look, you know, for these people at the beginning, you know, here's the basics. It's real basic stuff. Um, but it's enough for you to have an impact on, on the science. And we're seeing that want, clinically. Right? You want... Absolutely. You, you, so we need to... It's like everything, Paul. Um, we're also um, talking to the sort of some of the other oral diagnostics. And some of them, again, are trying to give us... Uh, and again, I speak to them a lot now. Um, and what they're trying to do is, is give me, um, you know, 50 bacteria where the reality, because they've got the PCR measures to be able to test them, but the reality of that is that there's probably six that are clinically relevant. Mm. So, I, you know, you confuse people and you lose your patients. Yep. So what we're really after is clear, almost like stripped back. You know, we don't need this. We want it really clear, really simple, stripped back so that your practitioner doesn't get lost and your patient doesn't get lost as well. So, as you say, we, we're, we're, we will do, there's lots, as you say, six comprehensive modules um, they will ha you'll have, I've built and recorded two case studies so far. There's going to be another one that I'll do. And then I'll be continually loading onto you. There is a, we've built, as you say, a platform where there's an online community, which I'll consistently load more stuff on. Um, and then of course, there's a, there's a certificate assignment. Yeah. So we want to make sure that you've got some degree of, you know, understanding. understanding even if it's a basic because like everyone we've got to start somewhere and we want to you to understand that even if you do the basics well you'll do a good job 
Um, but here's the thing, what I'd, what I'd like to say um, to anyone here is that we, I, I had a conversation with, with everyone um, before I came on, because I knew I was going to speak to you. We're prepared to give anyone who's listening today to come on the course. We're prepared to do, to do a genomics test and the course, and we'll do that for 150 quid. So you'll essentially be getting it for free. Yeah. If people are interested. Around that sort of money anyway. The test, well, again, if we're looking at the genomics, the genomics test, we're looking at 150 quid. Yeah. Um, so you will essentially be getting the test and what you'll be able to do is have that test ready for when um, the course comes out. So it's not that you'll be going into it raw, you'll be able to already look at, look at that. So, you know, we're prepared to look at this and think, I tell you what, from the people, because of I've had lots of connections for you, that's, I mean, you know, we, we feel as though this is going to be a test that is going to be utilized by many people. So mm -hmm. we can sort of be a bit ballsy and say, well, you know what, anyone listening now who wants to buy up now, yeah. We're good to go at that price. So, I think okay, so it's for practitioners as opposed to an yeah. end user. However, once the course is up and running and you've got practitioners that have got their certification, anyone, can use that. anyone as a patient can go and maybe find a practitioner? So, what, well, yeah, the whole, the whole point about this is that we want to make sure that people who have done our course has, have a good, uh, you know, can utilise the test because they've gone through robust training. So what they will do is that once they've done that test, that they have access to to, to use that test whenever they want. Right. So, so well, we I'm, I'm looking at from a from an end user perspective. If someone's listening to this who's not a practitioner, which the majority of people are going to be, there are going to be a lot of practitioners that do listen. But for the end user that's thinking, I'm an APOE4, I have inflammatory problems, where can I get that test? But they, yeah, they so can't come directly. They're going to have to find the, the practitioner. They're right? going to have to find through, yeah. I, I, they're going to have to come through a, an accredited practitioner, Paul. And I just think it's just because it, it's just a bit of a diligence aspect, isn't it? You know, you want to feel you want to feel that if people have done your training, that the tra training's robust enough for them to go away and at least have some good understanding of how to start applying it. So, so okay. yeah, so... And um, people will have to go through a certified practitioner on this, which, you know, is it is just a due diligence? Fine. So I'm think. going to say now I'm going to give you 150 quid and I'm going to do the course when it's ready. And so if anybody does want to get access to that test for themselves, they can contact me. And within, yeah. I'm guessing, three months from this date, which is the 18th of May 2021, hopefully I'll have done your course and be certified um, and, and we can um, potentially start using it. Um, directly with patients um yeah well uh, well as you say i think it, you know like anything is that um an experienced practitioner needs a big toolbox absolutely. and so you need you need to be able to know which tools do you need to pick out uh, what we found uh, and certainly what i found is that for for many of my patients as i look back not every every one of them because some people have fantastic teeth it's never a problem yeah you know, and this is the key thing, you know, it's identifying, yeah, you know what, I've got a bit of gum recession, my teeth do bleed. You've already, you know, you're already answering the question that probably it's going on and you, you really want to do the second and third steps then because you might be thinking, you know, and I developed rheumatoid arthritis three years ago and I was like, well, is that being driven by, by your periodontal disease? Mm -hmm. It's definitely a question you've got to think well, about. I'd love to see papers with things like MS and um, some of the other longer chronic issues and, and what they what those sort of patients are suffering with already. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I look at this and, and you know, I, I, there's, there isn't, and there's a, brand, there's a brand new paper that's just come out in Nature Reviews last month and really looking at this. And the beauty of that one is that we're going to include that because it's almost um, all my work over seven years. It's almost like these two guys have sort of wrote, you know, almost like wrote the course on this paper. I'm like, oh my God, this is like so perfect for, understanding what I've got to do over those last years and there's nothing there's no any inflammatory led dis disease or disorder is is going to have an underpinning how much underpinning of course Paul mm. um by what is happening orally and what I would say about this is what you've got to remember is is that if there is a you know your immune system is at war every second of every day um and if it's losing the battle then that means that your immune system you know inflammation oxidative stress it cannot be turned off yeah. it can't possibly be turned off and you've got to try and dampen that down and, and all you're doing there as, is sorry Pete, as you get older it becomes more difficult 
absolutely. You know, people are, like, I see patients 50, 60, 70 years old, and they are inflamed, and you see it in all the markers, whether it be bloods, whether it be mold, organic acids, toxicity, whatever it is, and you can see it just in them. It's just inflamed, inflamed, inflamed. And even when you do lots of good work over a long period of time, you're never getting the traction you want, and why, why, which is why this is so interesting to me. Because well, I think, I think what, all, what, what you also identified at the beginning is that, you know, you are, you're, you're, I think we're exposed to a lot these days and maybe we're not as robust as we should be. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, for some people, it, it's very difficult, isn't it? You'll have patients where it's an incredibly difficult struggle yeah. and you've got to take a layer off and you've got to take a layer off and you've got to take a layer off. Okay. Um, what we've been able to do, as you say, is that we believe this is a fundamental test going forward because... It, it, it sits there in your toolbox. You might not use it with every patient, but we're going to build you that process where number one, you've just got you, number one, you've got to ask the question, you know, and, and, and be detailed with asking the question because your patients at the moment won't recognize that what is happening in their mouth is probably in some way associated or, or, or in many ways causative to why they're coming to see you in the first place. And so, and so until you get to that point and you've, you've asked that question, it, it, it's almost like they, they, they don't make a relationship. Yeah. But then when you, as you say, you just seem to see, see the, the evidence and you're like, holy cow. I mean, it's also, gonna complicate, it's also going to complicate other things like trying to detoxify other issues if they've got heavy metals or, or mold or whether other toxicities that are sitting in them if your immune is always trying to fight something else, your detoxification is always going to be compromised. Everything's so, going to struggle, Paul. Yeah. And, and so and, it really is. What, what I remember, just out of curiosity, how do we reestablish a good oral microbiome? Is there a way of doing that? Do we maybe... Well, again, I, I think this is where we get the indication. So uh, the reality is you've got to do the... the, uh, uh, the and there's a couple of deeper layer, layers to this that we're, we're just getting into the dentist. So I'll give you an example is that um, I've just had some 3D x-rays of my jaw um, that are very informative. Um, I had a root canal done about three years ago um, that um, never had a root canal before. And I knew as soon as it was done, it wasn't quite right. And so the, the 3D um, x-rays have, and has identified that I've got a small infection there. And so, you know, my, what the dentist is saying to me is that, you know, because you're quite healthy, that's not, that's probably not bothering you, but there might become a tipping point where you might need to do something about that. But, but um, isn't it, not isn't only, it true, sorry, but is it not true that your, your immune can't get to your root canal, can't, can't get to that sterilized area. So that sits in so, there and it will, it will release. Yeah, so, so the, it yeah, absolutely. So, so this is what we're learning again. I mean, Paul, it's opened a whole new world for me. What we're learning about root canals is probably 50% of root canals are infected. Yeah. And that is because just by the nature of bacteria dentists can't fully clean the the root out it's impossible for them to do so you know 50 percent of us who maybe have had root canals have got some degree of infection that may be in some people the tipping point of why they're sick or certainly a root causative i mean for me that i think i'm pretty robust you know that i'm okay but the reality is there's still an infection there and again when we're looking you know even if you look at something like uh, the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease you know any infection is potentially changing your lipids because they're part of your immune system and they're, and they're, you know, they're trying to protect you. So again, we're getting this much deeper and richer understanding of, holy cow, we need to think about this. We need to think that. And it's overwhelming for sure. Um, mm. But we're learning all this. What we're also learning again is that what, what the, the, again, Dr. John Roberts, who again, one of the most foremost biological dentists, mate, incredible to the stuff that he's, that he's telling me about me. He believes that, you know, they've analyzed me they've, and we've just had the, we just had the report back. And he thinks um, that um, I'm probably um, in low oxygen states at night. I might have some degree. I mean, I'm me, mate, who's, you know, 10% body fat. You know, it's like, I can't possibly be um, having problems with low oxygen at night because, you know, I'm about as trim as you're going to get for, a, you know, for a 50 year old bloke. And yet it's like, mate, it's got nothing to do with that. It's the fact that the way you sleep with your jaw yeah. is that, you know, you're affecting all that. And that, and of course, anything where you're getting dry mouth at night, you're getting low oxygen states is also very strongly implemented with the, with the periodontal disease progression. So it's got nothing to do sometimes with what I'm doing. And that is good diet, a lot of phytochemicals, really good daily habits, you know, a lot of nutraceutical use, et cetera. 
So for me, it's this massive battle. And he's saying, you know, we may need to think about having to think, think about the way you sleep with your jaw, because what they're looking at is that you can see where your teeth are rubbed down here because, you know, he even suggests I might, might be grinding my teeth at night. I'm like, that. I can't be possibly doing that, you know, um, you know, but it's like, oh, well, that sort of makes sense because, you know, I do find it I do, certainly on the periodontal side, it's a struggle for me. Yeah. You know, I'm just one of those susceptible people. Right. It, it, yeah, so, it, it, it's such a, it, it's such an interesting subject, the whole thing. I mean, it, it really is another layer to this whole function medicine and looking at everything from a complete perspective, root cause kind of thing. And um, yeah. I think it's brilliant. I think it's great what you've done. So can I say to anyone, and particularly practitioners who are listening, that if they want to, um, get in contact with me and have you got my details paul i have i'll put them in the show is, is there any, i mean i know you're going to put this out or whatever but if they want to if they if they feel as though this makes sense for them um i'd like to think it does then we will absolutely offer them you know if, if they do the test for 150 quid they can come on the course for free right. um and um you know that's i think that's the deal that we're, we're looking to give and of course that includes you thank you sir appreciate that i will um, so, we'll, we'll, we'll talk after this and i'll and I'll pin you the money over and we'll get it, we'll get it set up. And whenever the course That's is good. ready, let's get on it. Um, but listen, in the meanwhile, um, thanks for coming on. Interesting, yeah. not, not just the, uh, the, the, the information, but the thunderstorms and, and your, your newly found um, internet issues with, uh, with thunderstorms in London. But um, good to see you again, mate. It's been a while. And, and now that this supposed COVID thing is, is on the way down, and we're allowed to see people. Hopefully, we'll, we'll bump into each other again at a, yes, another like conference, that. which you normally do. Kind of, kind of our, our sort of thing. Um, like but until that. then, where is the best place for people to get in contact with you personally if they want to do any work with you or ask you any questions? Uh, well, I think just to just to go onto our website, which is uh, is being revamped, um, which is function. If you put Functional Medicine Associates London just into a Google search, we'll we'll, we'll probably come up quite high on the on the Google search there. So, um, but I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to leave my details because, um, mm. you know, we'd we'll, like we'll to get the scores the, out. We'll put them in the show notes and also DNA Smiles in there because there, there is a site up there for DNA Smile with just the basics up there to, to show what it's talking about. So um, people right. can look around that as well. But mate, thanks Good. as always for your time. And um, I will look forward to catching up again soon. Pleasure. Well, mate, Pleasure, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. So there, don't move. <laughs>